Hey everyone, my name is Eric Brinkman. I'm one of the product directors here at GitLab. And today I was gonna do a quick walkthrough of some new features that our section has delivered over the past few releases. Um, I thought the easiest way to do this is probably just pull up the 13.0 release post and so I can go through some of these features and just see how they're working. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. All right, so on the left, I have the 13.0 release post, and on the right, I've got GitLab open. And so the first thing I notice is we have Giddily clusters as a headline feature. I think I will do a walkthrough of that process in another video because it requires some infrastructure setup and just a little bit more pre-work. Um, but I see the second headlining feature is Epic Hierarchy on Roadmaps. And so I wanted to play around with Roadmaps and Epics a little bit today. So the first thing I want to do, though, is actually see what the release post says about Epic Hierarchy on Roadmaps so I can understand um, just making sure that I'm testing the feature in, in the right way. So it looks like when leveraging multi-level Epics, it's difficult to keep track of where each child Epic lives on the Roadmap. You can now quickly expand a parent epic on your roadmap to view all its child epics to ensure work is properly organized and your plan timeline is on track. So just looking at this screenshot, what I would expect to see is like a little uh, expansion drop down over here that shows sub epics. So it's nothing to do with expansion of issues, but um, of, of children epics. And then I would, I would expect to see those, those epics here on the, on the roadmap. So let's go ahead and and get started. And I've been playing around with this a little bit, so I'm not gonna start from scratch, but I'll tell you what I'm doing. So right now I'm in the gitlab.com uh, group and um, I've made a test epic. I've made three issues in that epic, which aren't gonna be super relevant for this particular feature because this really only is about multi-level epics. So let's just make sure we set up our epic properly first, and then we'll go over to the roadmap feature. So I'm gonna use this newly created um, button here, which is going to let me add a new epic. So I'm gonna call this Eric's test child epic, epic number one. And I'm assuming that's going to link this as a child epic underneath this particular epic, which is, which is very nice. Uh, I'm also going to make um, a new label just so I can find this. Maybe there's one called product walkthrough. There's not, there's no product walkthrough label. So I'm going to create a group label called product walkthrough. We'll make that orange, create it. And it looks like it did not automatically assign that label even though I, I added it, which I think that if you're adding a label over here in the assign label, area, it's most likely due to the fact that you would like to automatically have that label assigned to your epic or issue. So maybe that's a little quality of life improvement that we can have. Anyway, let's just find the label we just made, product walkthrough, and add that label. So now we've got two labels on this epic. And let's go ahead and nest this twice more. So let's go ahead into, into the first child epic, add a new epic, Eric's test child epic number two. And let's add one more, one more layer. Eric's test child epic number three. I'm gonna come in here afterwards and have to clean up after myself because uh, I really needed a group that had gold on gitlab.com as you can see these epic features um, are really limited to the to the ultimate or gold tier. <clears throat> so I'm playing around with one of our GitLab groups. Okay, so now we've got uh, a, a bunch of tiering happening. And I want to make sure that, let, let's just see what, how it shows up on the roadmap without assigning any sort of um, time boxes to any of these. But first, let's go back to my list of epics because we also do have the epic tree view and I want to make sure that that displays properly. Okay, so you can see this test epic, expand that. 
Okay, so you can see I've got a top level epic. Let's capitalize this. Oops, that's not what I wanted. There we go. So I've got the top level and then three layers deep. Let's go over to the roadmap to see if we can get this to display. So let's go ahead and click on roadmap. And the first thing I notice is that this is taking quite a while to load. And I know the reason for this is because we don't um, we don't page paginate this feature, um, and loading two thousand epics at one time is is not ideal. But we should probably spike into that a bit to make it a little bit more usable. Okay, the second thing I notice is a new feature that we just launched, which is <laughs> adding your milestones onto the roadmap view. But this group has so many milestones that. I can't even see any epics at the start, and this is this is rather messy. I'm wondering if it makes sense for to allow us to collapse these milestones or or to hide them, uh, especially in the case where there's a lot of people working out of a single group, and and you may have a ton of milestones, or maybe the milestones are just utilized for very short time boxes, um, which would be interesting. So that's that's another thing I just noticed. So. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Okay. I didn't like that. One other thing I'm noticing is I'm scrolling here, but it doesn't seem like my screen is keeping up. And I'm wondering if it's just how we're rendering this page with so many epics on it. Like I'm scrolling up all the way and it's getting caught. Okay, looks like it finally completed. Let's go back down. And it looks like here is here is one that we can expand. So it has children epics. And I can I can tell here from this icon, which is nice, it's got five child epics. This one has three. And then looks like this one's nested. Oops. There we go. Okay. Yeah, this one has one, and so it ends here. And so what I can see is that this is the top level epic. Oh shoot, I didn't want to actually go to it. I can't see a ton of information, so I'm not sure how this. Let me go back. It's going to take a while to load now, unfortunately. Instead of playing around with the big list, let's filter this and see if it's a little bit more performant. So let's do that filter onto the label is. I can tell even loading the label list is taking a while here. And let's do the product walkthrough label. See, so yeah, I'm, I'm typing and it's just getting, it's getting hung up. I think in general, this page is just not very, very performant. Shoot, that's not what I wanted to do. So I'm going to have to go back and try again. Label is I know that the other label on my epic was Eric's test label. So let's try that.
in general, clicking around here is is just very sluggish. All right, we finally got that filter, and then I'm going to hit enter to apply that filter. Okay, so something happened that I was hoping wouldn't happen was none of these milestones are applicable to my any of the epics on my label that I filter by. And so I can I can still see them. And as you can see, it's the first thing that I see, which is just context that I don't need at this point in time. So scrolling down, I can see, okay, I successfully was able to filter down to that epic. And if I click on that, uh, oh, that's really interesting. So I tried to expand it, but it's telling me that none of my child epics match the applied filter because none of my child epics actually have that label. Ah, that's really counterintuitive because maybe I, I don't have like great label hygiene, but I know that the top thing, the top epic has the label that I need. And so, ah, that's really, really, really interesting. So let's go ahead and I guess fix that so we can get them to show up. Um, but that's um, this is why we do these walkthroughs so that we can find these little kinks like this. So I'm going to open this epic in another tab, and I'm going to go into these epics one by one. New tab. Open link in new tab and open link. A new tab and I'm just going to apply Eric's test label on all of these okay so now all of these have the right label I'm assuming that I can't get this to refresh on the fly so I'm gonna have to refresh the whole page Okay, at least the hover does say some child epics may be hidden due to applied filters. Okay, all right. All right, so we've got the right filters applied. We've got the right labels. We should see these epics. There we go. It's interesting that I have to click expand for all of these. I'm wondering, um, I think we limit child epics to five deep anyway. So I'm curious if it just makes sense to just expand all of this by default. And then if someone didn't want to see enhanced fidelity, they could collapse um, a middle one. But okay, so we've got, now we've got our, um, our child epics on the roadmap view, as you can see, I don't, I didn't do anything with due dates or milestones on, on any of these children epics. So they're going to just say there's no start date and it looks like we default end date to August 31st, 2021. I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's just a way to cut it off on the end of the roadmap view. Uh, the red line is today's date. So I can see where we are. Um, and then I could see this in conjunction with with my milestone. Unfortunately, the only milestone I actually care about is Eric's test milestone because the only issues attached to this epic, you can only have one milestone per issue anyway, and they're only assigned to Eric's test milestones. And so I lose a bit of context as I, as I have to scroll up because I, you know, I, I don't necessarily care about this or this or any of these milestones for what looks like these sprints over here. So that's interesting, um, but um, it's nice to be able to expand this on on the roadmap, and I I do like uh, I do like this. This is this is a nice thing. I I do wonder about the filters though. Um, if you've got filters. 
it wasn't intuitive, but I think I, I understand why it works that way. Something to think about. All right, so that is, um, that is that feature. Another feature that we've we recently put onto our roadmaps is is displaying the weight uh, or the progress. And so let's play around with that for a little bit. So let's put let's give this um, let's give these issues weights. So let's close the children epics and let's open up the three test issues that we have. And let's give them all a weight. So I'm going to give this one a weight of three. Give this one a weight of five. And I'll give this one a weight of seven. Oh, interesting. I got an error here. In general, I really dislike these types of errors throughout the application. They happen a lot on the merge request as well. Because one, I don't actually see anything wrong. Um, one, there was no comments on this on this issue anyway, so it's hard to tell if it actually failed to load the comments or not. Uh, but two, something went wrong. Okay, what went wrong? I don't know. Uh, there's no like call to action for me as a user. Like, should I just re refresh this page? Should I um, report this as a bug? Is this something that like I did wrong? Is it something the application is doing wrong? Uh, so in general, I may want to look at these error messages and make them a little bit more actionable. Um, especially if it's something that a reload could clear up, um, we can maybe recommend a reload. Um, but in general, it would be better just not have any of these errors at all. Okay, we now have weights. Let's go back and refresh the, the roadmap and see what that looks like. Okay, so it looks like we've got zero of 15 weights completed. And we don't have any way to say how far along an issue is to say, hey, one of three ways completed. So my, my uh, intuition tells me uh, if I close this issue, then I will get three of 15 weights completed. So I've closed the issue. Let's go back to the roadmap view and see if that actually happened. As you can notice, I have to refresh this. It would be great to get the application to be more, more real time. And I know that's a, a large effort and there's a cross-functional team working on that. So thanks to all your hard work. And sure enough, so now we have three of 15 weight completed, which gives us a 20% completion um, off of that epic, which is, which is pretty neat. So that's a good, that's a nice way to kind of gauge uh, progress here. All right, so that's all for roadmaps. Let's go back and see what else we should touch on. All right, let's 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 talk about version snippets for a bit. And let's go ahead and play with those. So I'm gonna close all this roadmap stuff out. And I'm going to go to, oops, let's just go to my projects where I can play around with snippets and not be cluttering up a shared group or project. Go to a personal, let's see. Just going to a project here. All right, so now I'm in the snippets area and we just released version snippets, which, which is exciting. So I wanted to play with that a little bit. And I know this is going to require the terminal based off of how we've implemented it. So I, I've got that at the ready as well. Let's just make a new snippet and we'll version it. So the title, Eric's test snippet description. I'm gonna skip that and I'm gonna skip the file name. This is a nice little prompt here. Um, which indicates a maybe some contextual reasons why you'd want to give your snippet a file name because it'll add um, code highlighting. And then the other thing to notice too is that the editing space here has taken in my syntax highlighting preferences, um, which is which is buried in settings, and uh, and that's that's nice too. And, and I'll we'll talk about how that the web ID is making use of that syntax highlighting preference a little bit later. So let's just make a, a quick snippet. So um, Test number one, test snippet. And I'm gonna just make this a private snippet and I'm gonna create it. So now I'm looking at the snippet in the GitLab application. I can see the title. I have an embed box here, which is really interesting. Hmm. 
because I would think the the primary I would think the primary way that a snippet is shared, and this is just me speaking off the cuff, would be just via a direct link, not an embed into a another site. And so that might be something that we would want to swap around because having a one click copy would be would be nice. At least that's how I personally use snippets um, throughout my career. So I see I see the snippet content here and um, one of my favorite things to do with snippets is to open it in raw formatting. You can do that here. You can download it, which looks like which looks like this. And you can copy the file contents, which I'm not 100% certain what that does. Okay, it just copies the text. All right. I, I really don't have much in the way of the UI telling me that I have versioned snippets without me reading the blog post. I think the only thing really telling me is that I have a clone button, which would indicate that I have a some sort of get back to repository. Maybe that's intuitive to people. Maybe it's not something to potentially consider. But I'm just going to go ahead and clone this to, to test this out and pull up a terminal over here. So. Let's say snippet. And then I'm going to do a git clone. All right, so it looks like it just gave it a, a title name because I refused to, which is which is fine. Let's just see what that snippet shows though. So let's cat the oh, that's a directory. Okay, and the default name snippet file one dot text. All right, so we'll cat that. Okay, so we can see that we have the version, uh, sorry, the content of the snippet here, and let's just do a git log, so I can easily see. Obviously, like this is this is a git backed um, version controlled snippet. So let's go ahead and make a change here. Actually, let's do the, let's do something from the UI first. Let's make a let's make a change here, and I'm going to add a line number two test. I'll do this on the bottom. Number two. Let's add number two here. I'm going to save the changes. And let's just. Let's just clone this again. All right. So now if I, I'll just open this in Vim. I can see that it pulled down the right con the, the right content. Um, and now let's do a git log. And now I can see two commits. Um, and it looks like it just defaulted me a commit message behind the scenes when I edited that in the in the UI, uh, which is great. Uh, let's go ahead and do the reverse. So let's go ahead and make a change. And add a number three here, right, and quit. And then let's go ahead and um, get stage, stage that, get commit um, number three change. And then we'll just do a get, a get push. I do a git log, I can see there's now three commits. I get the git log dash p. I can actually see the changes, the diffs here. And then if I refresh over here, I should be able to see number three show up, and I did. Okay, so that works. That works great. In the UI, I have no way to get back to a previous version. I have looks like I have no way to even indicate that there are prior versions. 
So you'd have to clone the snippet and then run a git log command to understand that. I'm gonna go back to the snippet list to see if there's any visual indication here. It looks like no. So that might be something we want to um, we want to work on, or at least make a more visual experience for viewing uh, for viewing prior versions. But um, overall, the feature seems to work pretty well. So that is versioned snippets. And then lastly, I wanted to touch on the dark theme in the WebIDE. And so let's go ahead and my favorite way to get to the IDE is to go into the handbook and to go to the page that I keep up to date on a monthly basis, which is the dev direction page. And then I'm just gonna open the web IDE. If you didn't know that, there's your life hack for the day that you can open any page from the handbook in the web IDE with a single click. And what's really cool is that I immediately feel like I'm in, an, in my local IDE, IDE uh, experience. So when I do have to modify things locally, I use um, Visual Studio Code, VS Code. And I'll just pull this up over here to the left. And you can see how similar of, a, of an experience um, that is with respect to just the look and feel, the, the dark background and, and uh, some of the text highlighting options. So that's really neat. And um, just highlighting that this works if you've selected your syntax highlighting preference to be the dark theme. Uh, and now we're going to do a quick walkthrough of seeing if we can find how to actually change that setting. Um, I think it is a profile setting. I believe it's in preferences. And it is. Found it the first time. So in your profile settings, in your preferences over here, you can see that not only can we change the navigation theme, so you can change this bar, but you can also change your syntax highlighting theme and mine is selected as dark. And if you select yours as dark, you will get a dark themed web IDE experience. All right, I think that's probably a good stopping point for today. Let's see if there's anything real quickly that I wanna highlight over here. Ooh, maybe value stream analytics. Let's actually do that real quick. So I'm gonna go back into GitLab and I'm gonna use the GitLab, the actual GitLab project to look at this one. And before I even play with the feature, I'm gonna go ahead and give this another read. So it says two, two key value stream metrics now give teams a baseline against which process improvement efforts may be measured so that they may more easily see the impact of process changes. Lead time measures the elapsed time between a requested item and its delivery and cycle time measures the length of the development cycle itself, so the time that um, it actually was worked on. By optimizing flow across the entire value stream, teams avoid moving a problem from one place to another and ship faster. Okay, so I'm gonna click on the documentation very quickly. And the first thing I notice is just from the breadcrumbs here, this is a group level feature. So I'm gonna go into the group level feature. And I'm going to click on analytics and I see value stream here. Sure enough, at the top, I see lead time and cycle time based off of my own. Okay, we saw an error message here that that wasn't ideal to see and then it just went away. So I couldn't even really read it. I think it says something about calculating median stages. Uh, the first thing that I think of here though is that something is probably wrong. Um, and the reason I think it's it's likely wrong is because we have we have items that have set in our backlog for three three, four years. So a 2.7 day lead time seems off. Um, and I, I can't click on here to actually understand how that was how that was calculated if it's if it's using all issues in the backlog or if it's not. Um, the same thing for cycle time. Cycle time seems incredibly fast, 0.8 days, saying from the time I'm working on something to the time that I've delivered it is less than a day. Seems very, very fast. Um, we do ship at a very high uh, speed 
and our MR rate for engineers is increasing every month, but I know that that that's probably a little bit too quick. But I also have no way to like debug that or understand just at, a, at, at my fingertips how that data is being derived or, or calculated. Um, as you can see, the other the other thing here is we've got 42,000 issues in this project, or sorry, 42,000 issues in this group. Maybe I need to select a project first before getting better before getting better data. But if that's true, then I would need I should have a prompt for that. It says not enough data. My my guess is that there's too much data, but um, that's not a super descriptive um, message here. So let's go ahead and select a project and see if I actually get better data here. Nope. I think I just want GitLab, not GitLab-org. I can't change it now. That's grayed out. There we go. Okay, this is a problem. I can't even find GitLab in this list. I know the most used project in this group is called GitLab, and I feel like contextually it should show up at the top. Maybe it's this, but I'm confused by these this lock and this icons. I don't I don't know what that means, and I don't know what this icon means. I would have expected a Tanuki icon because that's the icon that we that's the icon that we use for that project, as you can see here. So I'm a little bit I'm a little bit confused here. Um, As you can see, this this is just not a great experience. We we give you a, a number less than a minute, but oh, okay. So there was an empty state that said we don't have enough data to actually show you this, but then then data magically appeared. So that's something that we would we would need to fix. Let's see if it happens again for plan. We don't have enough data to show this stage, but I have a median number over here. Ah, now it, now the issue one says we don't have enough data. I wonder what I need to do to coax it to show me the, the list of issues. All right. Well, I think that's going to be all for today. Um, looks like we've got a number of things to fix. And uh, I'm excited at the, the rate of iteration from our teams. Uh, but it's also important for us to go back and polish and stuff. So thank you all for watching. If you did, I appreciate you all. Have a great weekend and talk to you later. Bye.